la vérité touche au réel. Young Zizekians have assembled. We have a very special guest. We have a special guest with us. Brian Becker, Dr. Tom McGowan himself, the inimitable Russell Spriglia, Isabel Millard, engaging in conscious. In the imaginary domain, we have an intersubjective dialectic. Vanishing mediators. Immediate. Big Sig, how was your holidays? How did they go? Yeah, yeah, no, I would prefer not to, but my holidays were well. <laughs> Where you have like pretty much like 30 minutes of just banter and then you get like 10, 15 minutes of actual theory. <laughs> but it's just the basic yeah. jot downs. <laughs> just so people know that we're friends outside of these sessions right. and we're relatable people and you can sow the seeds of a parasocial relationship with us and that'll increase our followers and yeah <laughs> et cetera et cetera and then you clip but no, we're not going to do that minutes of actual content and make it like a short and then yeah. you put it on the link that's how it yeah. works yeah yeah subscribe or to the like patreon. subscribe to the patreon like this guy i like his skits he's called man carrying thing he had a short skit that was about <laughs> like which is better underproduced content that's very technically in you know involved or overproduced content that has little content ultimately and it's like the first one's better than like the stuff that's you know beautifully animated really well edited but like in the end there's not much meat to it yeah like <laughs> um anyway let's get started <laughs> today presenting on Lecture 11 of Seminar 3 on the Psychoses, Shock Lacan. This lecture is on the rejection of a primordial signifier. And the way I'm going to do this today, I don't know if you two are looking at uh, our shared doc right now, but would be helpful if you pulled that up. The way I approach this today is basically providing my exegesis exegesis of different passages in this lecture and i'm not going to read you the entire lecture with the commentary i'm going to skip some comments maybe we'll make this available to listeners in the near future but basically i'll just indicate which paragraphs I'm talking about and give you my thoughts on them. Hopefully I won't go on too, too long, but uh, I would ask that you to, you know, hold off on your comments till near the end. And then we'll just kind of powwow about everything. Sound good. Sounds All right. So good. let's begin. Um, <clears throat> We are in this lecture talking about the economy of the psychoses, which is linked to an analysis of the structure. So when we think about structure, we think about economy. When I think about economy, I think about libidinal economy. Many of Freud's topographical models have to do with libidinal economy. And when I think of this word economy, I think of inputs and outputs, seminar two, focused heavily on cybernetics, input, output, and libido is kind of all about input and output. And ultimately, the input of excitations and the draining off of those excess excitations, which the entire psychic apparatus is uh, sort of, for lack of a better term, designed to manage, always sort of fails. You know, repression works to an extent but the psychic apparatus that is in play here ultimately fails meaning there are always consequences to repression but we're not talking about repression here what we're talking about is ver ver fung foreclosure and what that has to do with the psychotic delusion which lacan feels is Deeply misunderstood by mainstream psychiatric, especially approaches to psychosis. Um, 
The second paragraph I wanted to comment on what Lacan says here about his way of proceeding, which is scientific rather than phenomenological. The, ph the phenomenological view sees a certain essential reality within the phenomena, which kind of has to be sifted out of that phenomena. He says, no, at the, at the end of the day, our way of proceeding is scientific. And to look for something more subsistent behind phenomena is what science is all about. Milner, not Miller, but Milner, uh, who Max here put me on to, has a great book. I always get the title wrong. Is it In Search of Clarity or A Search for yeah. a Search for Clarity? I think the, the English title is In Search of Clarity. In Search of Clarity. Great book. Very unorth a very unorthodox approach to the question of science in Lacan, but he says something really interesting there, which is that psychoanalysis aspires to the ideal of science, but is not itself an ideal science. Science as an ideal is the guiding light for psychoanalysis, but whether or not it can be considered a science in its own right is a matter of debate. So maybe in the future we'll discuss more the idea of science as seen from the point of view of psychoanalysis, of psychoanalytic thinking, but suffice it to say that psychoanalysis sort of occupies this, I would call it like interstitial zone between sociology, anthropology, the hard sciences, and philosophy. But it still sets as its ideal science. Lacan here wants to sort of differentiate a common sense approach from a dialectical sense of uh, a, a dialectical approach, which is more his. And this common sense approach really, maybe it's too strong to say wants to do away with these Freudian structures, but wants to operate without them, outside of them, because it's geared more towards understanding in the immediate sense and understanding of effects, the effects of its interventions. Um, I'm talking about psychiatry as opposed to explanations and the way that Lacan, as he admits in this lecture, goes about explaining things as dialectical, although he's going to opt for a genetic approach to the, the topic at hand for the sake of convenience. I want to say here that it really kicks off with this statement, the unconscious for the psychotic, I'm adding that is present but not functioning. That's what Lacan says. And I interpreted this as meaning it's not functioning because if you think about it, what is the unconscious but it's self-negation? And this primordial negation leads to repression. And it leads to a zone of all that which is not conscious. Now, this isn't necessarily a zone in the sense of a, the model of a depth psychology. It's not, the as we always emphasize, the basement of containing animalistic impulses and drives and unacknowledged desires. But this act of making contents unconscious, not conscious, leads to the inception of something that we call the unconscious. In psychosis, the activity of the unconscious is present in a sense, but we could say it's not functioning because it can't carry out the function of repression, which is a negation. So foreclosure is a rejection. Uh, it is a sort of closing off of a certain space. There is a negativity involved there. But I wouldn't say that it is the sort of negation which leads to repression and the unconscious and neurosis. So foreclosure is a mechanism, and I think of it as ensuring the, the maintenance of a certain libidinal economy 
but in a very different way from repression, in a much more volatile way. Uh, then he talks about this deviant path that psychoanal uh, psychoanalysis has taken in his time. He's always at pains to sort of differentiate his approach from these deviancies. And this deviant path, of course, is like ego psychology, which is going to position the analyst as the model of a strong ego. And, you know, usually in this model, we're dealing with a neurotic who is going to reintegrate themselves into a certain social order via a reconstruction of the ego, which is going to stand on a stronger foundation after the analyst's uh, intervention. And later he talks about how it's like, well, he makes an interesting sort of comment that uh, there, there's something having to do with like the oral complex here, because with the Kleinian approach, you are in a sense taking in, interjecting, imbibing the discourse of the analyst in a way that would maybe enrich your ego, strengthen it. I could be wrong about the client. I don't want to mischaracterize the Kleinian approach, but I think that's what he's saying. He makes a very important comment here, which I think we should keep in mind throughout our exploration of this lecture. He says, if psychoanalysis inhabits language in its discourse, it cannot misrecognize it with impunity. Something that came to mind was a Heidegger quote which I don't know necessarily if Lacan had this quote on his mind, but I thought I would bring it up here. It's one of his most famous quotes, which is language is the house of being. And I thought house inhabit, psychoanalysis inhabiting language, psychoanalysis inhabits language in a way that is very different from Heidegger's phenomenology, I would say. And because of that, because the metapsychology that we're outlining here does constitute a discourse, and by discourse, I mean a kind of intersubjective bond, um, a social bond, symbolic reality, because not necessarily what happens in the session, but because psychoanalysis itself, if it is going to try to prop itself up as a discourse, it must not make the vital error of misrecognizing language. And I think this is kind of related to phenomenology in this way because it's a very different approach to language than the Heideggerian approach, which is the house of being. Psychoanalysis has something to do with being, but only incidentally let's say. It's not in search of being in the way phenomenology is. Let's just table that for now. Keep moving. All right, so now we're talking about the, the ego, which of course was the subject, no pun intended, of the first two seminars. And Lacan raises the question of how the ego in the psychoses relates to the external world in a way that is very, very problematic, which sets, sets in relief this disjuncture between the human subject and his, his umwelt, but we'll get there, his, his external world, let's say. Um, because the ego correlates to a world to use an, uh, uh, a Heideggerian term, um, is worlded or, you know, he says unworlded de or deworlded, I think. But let's say uh, the ego is worlded, if we're going to use world as a, a verb in that kind of Heideggerian sense. It's in a very non-harmonious manner. You know, there is a problematic correlation between internal and external which with ego psychology, there is a very uh, 
easy kind of uh, understanding of what would be the preconditions for a reality, a, a reality consistent with the subject's inner world. And there's it's just a question of adjustment. But what Lacan wants to show us with his theory of the logic of the signifier is how because the signifier fails to really suture this innenwelt and umwelt, I'm, I'm getting this from our conversation with Leon Brenner, that there is a failure that characterizes one's attempted adaptation to, to a world that would, in the way it does for the animal, attune him instinctually to this this milieu that is in in a sense already carved out for him waiting for him uh he talks about the ego here in psychosis as a as a hallucination you know the, uh, not this isn't um oh, sorry no uh he he talks about the ego in psychosis in the mainstream way seen as a kind of hallucination which would be a signal cause to warn of the emergence of a certain pressure, which would threaten the ego. This is a very common sense attitude. And that in that sense, hallucinations are uh, a sort of defense. And he, this is the uh, misconception, the all too easy presupposition, which he wants to sort of poke some holes in. And this is where I think it really, really gets interesting because he says something that took me some time to really digest and reformulate in my own words. And I went back to seminar one, actually. There's a great lecture in seminar one on ideal ego and ego ideal where the uh, the assembled um, Leclerc is there, Manoni and some others they reread um on narcissism very important uh freudian essay and lacan relates it to his optical schema which he develops throughout that seminar we won't go too deep into the optical schema right now because that would sidetrack us for another hour but we know that the ego, uh, the ideal ego, is the image seen in the concave mirror, and as I understand it, it's sort of an illusory synthesis of drive and soma, body, container, and of course, it's this impossible totalization of the image and motor action that one sees, that the baby sees in the mirror stage, and envies in a sense this sort of self-containment that it perceives in this image, which threatens uh, uh, their integrity in a way, like the integrity of their own whole wholeness, but also kind of invokes that wholeness, brings it into being. And then in this sense, it's like the image I would describe as the guarantor of their being, but also a threat to their being. Uh, this is like an ideal image. And there's a really interesting discussion in this lecture where they focus on the concept of idealization and what we mean by ideal. And what I have surmised from rereading this lecture is that the ideal ego takes ideal more in the sense of image. Like I was just saying, like a an image which is something totalized, totalizable, and framed. Um, a perfected form which one would aspire to match. The ego ideal, in a sense, refracts this ideal image through another, what I would call further idealization. And the ideal is both that lost form of the e ideal ego, in this case, in this further idealization, but also an ideal of a form which uh, lies beyond the immediacy of factical life, right? 
So this would bring the notion of ideal to me closer to the idea in the platonic sense, a perfection of form. And then in the social sense, it would be like who I, how I would like to be perceived, ideally. But all of these multiple meanings are baked right into this term. So it's like the perfectibility of the ego in neurosis is sort of contingent on the sort of social mandates in place within any given symbolic order. And ultimately, this ego ideal is captive to the other, big other, capital O, other, the locus of language, which I would describe as not only words, but the entire treasury of signifiers and the rules, laws, mandates that those belong to. The ego ideal derives its potency from this other. The psychotic doesn't have an ego ideal. So essentially, what is spying on him, following his every move, is this ideal ego, which you can imagine, without the intervention of the symbolic, has this persecutory um, sort of uh, role in the psychotic's life because it's you can imagine that 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 sense of cohesion that we might perceive as babies and when looking at that image in the mirror, even if this is a mythical moment, it does very much assail us, terrorizes us in a way. Um, the imaginary and the specular ego are conditioned by the symbol, ultimately. So what he wants to do here, and from the very start, from the beginning of seminar one, he wants to explain how the symbolic is hooked on the imaginary and how we can never take the domain of the imaginary on its own. It doesn't set terms of its own uh, with which we can understand it. So it's important to not, you know, take the Im imaginary as a stage necessarily. Uh, and the reason for that is that, you know, the symbolic agency of this negative structuration is constitutive of this repressed neurotic subject. There is this Bea. Bayong, I think is how it's said. I'll let Max correct me later. But this Yow. kind of primordial affirmation that's, you know, it's a symbol of negation. And this symbol of negation is necessary for the, what I would call fertilization of a kind of ego ideal. Without it, we don't have objects. Without it, we don't have differentiation. Without it, we aren't able to introduce into our life world, let's say, that minimal difference which separates signifiers. Uh, as Max points out in one of the comments um, that he left here, it's like the psychotic has metonymy, meaning, let's say, they're able to juggle signifiers in a way that would allow for a temporary kind of differentiation between them, but they don't have metaphor, which means ultimately they aren't able to make this substitution. If a metaphor is a substitution, they aren't able to actually substitute one signifier for the other. So they have to suffer this constant sort of alternation between presence and absence, which would be characteristic to me of the ideal ego. And this voice in their head is just that because they have not achieved an ego ideal. I won't get into my comment here about the delusion of freedom that he talks about. Um, Big Sig covered that in our last lecture and did a great job. But 
suffice it to say, the Doxa, which is not untrue, but the sort of mouthwashed proverbial understanding of psychosis is that there's this foreclosure of the name of the father and that the psychotic therefore doesn't have a law which regulates their behavior or how they relate to the outside world. That is true. They don't know prohibition in a sense, but I think what's underemphasized there is that radical negativity, that structuring negativity, which they lack. In a sense, they don't know absence. They don't know absence in the way a neurotic does, and hopefully that'll become clearer as we progress here. So basically, what Lacan wants to do is disambiguate his understanding of psychosis and the mechanism of projection from this imaginary transitivism, which we see when he says here, a child hits his counterpart and says, he hit me. It's not a lie because for him, he is completely identified with his counterpart in this ideal ego, imaginary sort of way he doesn't quite belong to himself at this point in his development it's an it's an imaginary order of relations and sometimes this imaginary order of relations is invoked to explain how psychosis works and how these hallucinations this other be it you know the little others um for Schreiber, let's just use that as an example. You know, be they the little others that enter Schreiber's body, assail him in various ways, or the big other, which is God, it would be too short-sighted to define these others as simply projections of himself, which aren't, you know, recognized as such. Because the imaginary order needs to be Differentiated from the symbolic here. Okay, how? Differentiated, but also show how they form a kind of dialectical uh, dynamic, which is com which is very misunderstood. We are not within the the bounds of a, a master slave dialectic in the Hegelian sense here. Psychosis is not a transitivism. So he says, okay, then what is the symbolic agency uh, which is structuring psychosis? Because they escape libidinal investment. What that means to me is that the kind of libidinal investment that we get with this sort of transitivism, this master-slave struggle, is not where we should look for the uh agency let's call it the mechanism of of psychosis um because even that master slave dialectic is still in a sense symbolically mediated already the imaginary order of relations can never really stand on its own what we're always describing when we have this like struggle to the death is still a symbolically mediated struggle this is not what the psychotic is experiencing what freud calls secondary narcissism is this libidinal reinvestment of the body i believe it's in on narcissism maybe that he calls it this and what that would mean is ambiguous i would say it's very ambiguous and i i really i gave it some thought because I wanted to connect this to this like refraction between ideal ego and ego ideal and moving from a stage of um, auto eritism to primary narcissism to object love as Brenner describes it. Check out that interview. One of the best conversations we've ever had.
basically, if secondary narcissism is a lib libidinal reinvestment of the body, you know, what would that mean? Well, I, I started to think about the myth of Narcissus because we often like forget about what actually happens in that myth. And at least the version that I'm familiar with, he sees his image in the reflective surface of, of a lake in the water and falls in love with it. The question is, does he recognize it as his own image? No, it's the image of an other for him. And it's an alienating other. This is something that Lacan really emphasizes here. The fundamental fact of the imaginary is not necessarily this master-slave dialectic struggle. The fundamental fact of the imaginary is alienation. And you can even see that portrayed in the myth of Narcissus. When we talk about narcissism in the colloquial sense, if you meet someone who's narcissistic, who's always steering the conversation back to them or has this inflated sense of their own abilities and talents and is megalomaniacal, that's one thing. But it's very different from narcissism in that sense. Narcissism in the sense of a secondary narcissism is profoundly alienating, right? So my whole point about the ego ideal here is that Someone with a strong ego ideal is going to be, in the more colloquial sense, more narcissistic. And that is the only way that they can achieve this new psychical action, as Freud puts it in our narcissism, that leads to this stage in which they are able to steer the focus away from their bodies and onto objects is if they're able to see, and this is me quoting Lacan here, see their own form materialized whole, the mirage of themselves outside of themselves. And that is, it's another kind of, in a, in a way, self-absorption, but it's one that allows for discrete objects and the recuperation of the imaginary wholeness of the ego ideal, uh, the ideal ego via the symbolization of objects in a phallic sense what would not just make one whole because people talk about feel, uh, filling a void no but recuperate the form of the ideal ego that is not a process that the psychotic goes through he he doesn't get there he's not capable of this new psychical action which would lead him there i'm going to jump ahead because i'm going on long but let's talk about let's talk about vernina okay um and let's talk about differentiality let's talk about this little quote here about day and night which is very important um where to begin okay what would be this reality of which the patient is in need of adjustment. What is this umfeld? He says, is there anything in man that has this both enveloping and co-opted character, which causes us to invent the notion of umfeld? He says, you know, basically we are very satisfied to and fascinated by animals because they are in a way narcissistic creatures. You know, Freud put, points this out. They're so enveloped in their own, des their desire isn't, doesn't appear as desire it's just it, it's such a clear shot towards what they want and it's the the fuck eat or self-preserve uh and their and their environment seems set up for that whether to you know make them pray for another animal or give them what they need to satisfy their basic biological urges but is there an umfeld for for the human being is there a milieu for the human being to which he could adapt himself big question yes and no there is one but in order for there to be a kind of umfeld for the human being it needs to be invoked 
It needs to be, let's say, it needs an opening. And the question is what leads to this opening wherein we have an other which is opaque, appears inaccessible, but which we acknowledge as the source of laws, language, rules, customs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This leads us to the the Verneinung essay, which is really important here. He doesn't so much talk about the essay as the concept, but uh, I reread uh, Zupanchich's great essay about this called Not Mother. Highly recommend it. And um, I want to talk about this day and night uh, sort of uh, apologue, I guess he likes to call it. Not in this case, but what is what is day and night? Well, okay, we have this what we think of as phenomena of day and night, and we tend to assume that the words day and night correlate to their reference. That's how we get the words, because we see that, oh, the sun's setting, it's dark. No, he says, day can only come about as a concept because there is this background of the possible absence of day. The opposite of day then fills in where the background of this possible absence has been left to accommodate it, in a sense. That's how we get these sort of... Um, oppositional dyads which the signifier stands for and I'll, i'm going to read something zizek says here and for they know not what they do talking about this very example he says differentiality designates a more precise relationship in it the opposite of one term of its presence is not immediately the other term but the absence of the first term the void at the place of its inscription the void which coincides with its place of inscription and the presence of the other opposite term fills out this void of the first term's absence. This is how one has to read the well-known quote-unquote structuralist thesis according to which in a paradigmatic opposition, the presence of a term means equals the absence of its opposite. The signifier's opposition of day to night, for example, does not convey a simple alteration of day and night as two complementary terms which together would form a whole. The point is, rather, that the human being posits the day as such, whereby the day is present as day against a background which is not the concrete background of night, but the possible absence of day wherein two night is located. And vice versa. That's what I just said. This alternation, as Lacan says, of the vocal connoting presence and absence on which Freud hinges his whole notion of beyond the pleasure principle. How can it be? Right? This is where Verneinung comes in. But he's talking about Ververfunk, foreclosure. But the brilliance of Lacan is that our access point here is a neurotic um, habit, we could call it, in a way, which is for Nainung. We encounter it in the session. Analysts encounter it in the session. I'll describe it in a bit, but basically, we have to think of it, as Freud says, as sort of the, the seal which would bear the uh, sort of made in the unconscious, which would bear the expression made in the unconscious in the way that like something would say made in Germany. If we encounter Verneinung, which the most famous example, of course, is I don't know who the woman in my dream was, but it's not my mother. But let's not focus on that example right now because it's just too hackneyed at this point 
the example Lacan uses here is I don't want to tell you about something that's very unpleasant, right? The patient might say, I don't want to tell you about something that's very unpleasant, but through saying that, the patient is, the analysand is in some sense manifesting uh, kind of like un unpleasantness, bringing a manifestation of unpleasantness into the session. So what does this mean? Why is this phenomenon of Verneinung important? What does it have to do with foreclosure and the locus of signifiers? The locus of the other, which is foreclosed by the psychotic. Well, repression is a mechanism. Repression is an economic mechanism. It has to do with libido, it has to do with excitations, which are too strong, too unpleasant, and too intense for the, the subject to really deal with. So there's a psychic apparatus which manages through inputs and outputs in the form of memory, registrations of memory, traumatic encounters, excess excitation. Only the problem is repression always fails. It doesn't drain off perfectly the libidinal intensity which comes with these excitations. And what that means is the, the neurotic develops symptoms. And those symptoms are cries for help, <laughs> in a way. Cries for help. And the cry for help is, please interpret me. Please put what I'm doing into words. You know, as Lacan says, the subject of the Freudian unconscious inhabits the signifier, he becomes the signifier, he empties his pockets, he does everything he can to act out this signifier without really knowing what the signifier is. Let's not take that too literally. But one of the, the most prime examples of this, of course, is, is Verneinung, where someone brings something up in a negative fashion, says it and doesn't say it effectively. Freud relates this to two stages, let's say. Whether or not they're real stages or not is, is a matter for debate. Lacan doesn't quite think so. And in the letter to Fleece, 52, uh, I think we would read that now and consider Freud a little bit too developmental here, a little too... Um, biological or biologistic in a way doesn't matter the idea here is that we begin as a pleasure ego and the pleasure ego introjects everything the pleasure e that causes pleasure for this pleasure ego is taken in and it's identified with and it's it's the inside for the pleasure ego everything that's bad everything that causes any measure of pain or just general unpleasantness is rejected. It's spat out. It's uh, expelled. And it belongs to the outside. Everything bad is identified with what's outside the ego. Everything good is identified with the ego itself. So we have an initial division, which is very simple at first blush, between what's good being inside and what's bad being outside. But unfortunately, we can't live that way, not if we're going to be good neurotics. So what that means is that we need, I'll use this phrase again, new psychical action to invoke another, well, invoke an outside 
which isn't just bad, let's say, in very simple terms, which isn't just bad, um, which could be bad, could be good. But in order to verify whether what we encounter is good or bad, there still needs to be an outside, which is, you know, TBD, always TBD. So this is called the judgment of existence, and it relies on reality testing. What's reality testing? Well, now we have these presentations in our minds. Remember, for the pleasure ego, a hallucination might as well be the real object. There's really no distinction there. And the famous example, of course, is the infant who, in lieu of the appearance of the mother's breast, hallucinates it. And that tides the baby over until the real thing arrives. But for the, the developed person, we need these presentations in our minds, which are full of distortions, but we measure that against the objects that we encounter. And banal sort of example, but still I think interesting is like, if you go back to your old school, your old neighborhood, a place you haven't been in a while, you have a distorted idea of what it looked like, the size of things, uh, where things were located and some things line up, some don't, but you become the uncanniness of it is just becoming aware of those distortions. That's like reality testing. You test this presentation that's internal against the external and we're frequently disappointed, of course. The repetition of these presentations is the essence of the drive in a way. It's this refinding of an object. This is where it gets complicated. Well, what is this object that we're constantly refinding and then losing in a sense because it's this is not it? Well, that I think would be the primordial signifier in a way. But this primordial signifier, we can't, we can't think of it as an actual signifier, one word, one formula, although Leclerc might disagree. You know, we have poor jelly, which like kind of in imaginarized form does stand in for this one word, which is the solution to quote unquote the, the subject. But how would I put it? The there's another bipartition. The first division with the pleasure ego is between good and bad and the identification that belongs to that. The second bipartition is one where we have what Freud calls the, the symbol of negation. That, I think, comes around with the imposition of the law as invoked by the name of the father. It is this structuring negativity. It is the very structuring negativity which allows for another within. I'm quoting Lacan here when he says he uses within as a, a noun, right? Another within. And it's the within of the big other, capital O other. We're able to acknowledge that there is a locus outside of ourselves and there's an inside to that locus and the objects that we encounter have to do with another inside, which is not ours. Knowledge of this signifier, though, in a sense, is repressed because there's a certain trauma that comes with this primordial signifier, this new psychical action. It's not an actual moment. It's a mythical moment. But I think there is a, a structuring negativity, a structuring traumatic real which the subject in search of this moment let's say is always the repressed subject always avoiding it because it isn't really a moment you can't quite represent radical negativity in signs but ne nevertheless as he says Lacan says it's it, it, it quoting Freud it is put into signs for nining it Verneinung is put into science. So what makes Verneinung really fascinating is what is put into words is the activity of this repressive mechanism itself, even though 
and the contents are sort of irrelevant in that sense. What that means is you could get the analyzan to acknowledge that the woman in the dream is his mother, despite the fact that he says it's not. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if there's an acknowledgement of the contents of repression. The repressive mechanism functions anyway. I'm going to try to tie it all together here. And I'm probably not going to linger too long over Freud and the mystic writing pad and his uh, sort of like what he calls a topographical regression here. Um, I feel like Andrew and, and Max, you might do a better job of covering that. So I'll, if you want to, I'll I'll leave that little section up to you. But I think what's really interesting here is that, okay, what, is, what does Verneinung have to do with foreclosure of Verfung? Well, it's because for the neurotic subject, this reality is, as he says, crippled, right? Or he's searching for that negative one, that lost object, which never was. And it corresponds to that second division, that bipartition, in my mind. I could be wrong about that. But the signifier is the very space opened up by, or the, let's say this missing object, this refound object object. I think refound is kind of misleading because it's it is never really found. It's a refinding, an endless refinding. The missing object is the primordial signifier and this primordial signifier is the opening up of this space which houses the battery of signifiers and the sort of negativity which allows the subject to represent the process of repression in language in the case of Verneinung without interfering with the activity of the repressive mechanism. I just said that, but like also allows the subject, the neurotic subject to historicize him, his past. And, and this is where it's going to link, I think with the next lecture, because he talks about the Wolfman, the primal scene, witnessing his parents going at it, coitus a tergo, right? And then talks about sexual desire, of course. I think I know where this is going in the, into the next lecture with uh, the hysterical question. But basically, what this does, what repression does, the ins is primal repression, I think, if I'm not using that incorrectly, is leads to the, the, the inception of the unconscious the negation which leads to the inception of the unconscious via the name of the father, which is, of course, laying down the law and creating a new outside or a new, a new inside that's outside. And that is freeing, even though it's castration, effectively. To not want to know anything about castration is at all times is to remain psychotic. And what that means is what's foreclosed here. Remember, it's like, isn't simply ignored, isn't simply known, but not known at the same time. It is truly unknown because it is truly rejected from the psychotics imaginary experience of the world it's rejected but because of that it comes back with a fury that is unknown uh, in the life of the re repressed subject even if the repressed subject is full of doubts and, and, and fears and is is you know uh, scandalized and disgusted by their own desire for the psychotic they well, at least the psychotic who's undergoing a, a breakdown, a psychotic episode. The their version of the return of the repressed is it's kind of like, you know, 
almost like Death Star proportions of uh, the primordial signifier, which returns in a sense, but it's been completely rejected. It isn't that ignored and ignored misleading because it's like it's not like, oh, well, the job of the analyst is to get you to acknowledge what you've repressed and make it part of your experience of the world. No, no, not at all. That's not repression isn't just ignoring, but there is ignorance as one of the three passions. This isn't simply a matter of ignorance. It It, it is in being foreclosed completely inaccessible in a way. It is not part of the historic historicization of the past of the psychotic subject. It comes back with a vengeance and what you know Lacan says is that um scrolling down here, there are these fringe phenomena at the level of reality be which become hyper significant. I'm adding hyper to that hyper sub significant for the the subject for the psychotic subject and one of the ways that this this shows itself is that uh what what max was uh talking about before we started recording the episode um this case of uh i guess maybe one of lacan's patients who had a friend who was the essential point of attachment in his existence this character withdraws and then i love how he puts this and then he's in a state of perplexity linked to a correlate of certainty. And I said, you know, that perfectly to me describes Schreber, who is to me both the most confused and most certain man alive. He's always confused, and yet he's so certain. Certain of what? God wants him. So I'll just close this out by saying, you know, or just first let's quote, uh, what is a very tortured sort of sentence here, but in a weird way describes what I've been getting at near the end of the lecture. Lacan says, how is the subject led not into alienating himself and the little other, but into becoming this something which from within the field in which nothing can be said appeals to all the rest to the field of everything that can be said. And what is this field of everything that can be said, but the big other, right? The locus of Verberpung, the foreclosed primordial space. So last thing I'll say, I wrote this this morning, you know, from what place or from this place, how does the psychotic appeal to an other capital O, which has not been given the externalizing space of otherness, which would make it a within distinct from the within of a sort of attributive pleasure ego. That process depends on a metaphorization, which is a substitution. And it is this substitution that the psychotic cannot make happen all right fiend very well very well that was really good i really like how you uh really touched on the importance of vernayong and how like lacan will even talk about the importance of seeing this uh german prefix that freud uses of ver and throughout his entire works and why he distinguishes between, you know, Verneinung and Verfung, because what was pretty much seen as like the functioning of psychosis in many of the revisionists uh, was to look at it as like uh, similar to like displacement, right? Or like all these like all these all these different hallucinations, all these different uh, caricatures of the psych psychotic, you know, hallucination or paranoia are forms of condensation, forms of displacement. But Lacan's like, no, like he has German terms for this, you know, uh, displacement and, and you know, condensation. If anything, uh, 
are more characteristics of uh, repression and how they act in the neurotic, especially when we talk about like the dream structure, which the dream structure is something that is exemplary of how we see the primary and secondary process split up and we get something that is satisfied on a secondary level, which leads me to something that ties in with, with that interpretation of dreams and, and these processes. Um, it, it's what's interesting about uh, the ego and what you pointed out, the uh, ego, the ideal ego as like the, the evil twin of uh, the ego, as he points out, and that's all too alien for him. And it was so good that you brought up that point in, in the narcissist myth is that he sees this image and he's kind of enthralled by it. He's caught in the specular lure, but he doesn't identify himself as it. He's not saying that that's me. I'm that beautiful. He's like, wow, this is so beautiful. And in a sense, we see how the specular lure is that mythic moment um, in the mirror stage, which quite frankly, I will we'll shout out that uh, uh, was it? Ordinary Unhappiness podcast, because they said that in the, the way that it's translated into French, that, and again, we've harked on this, this isn't like a historical stage, we shouldn't even think of it as a stage. Um, but we could play on words instead of seeing stage like a historical development point, we should see stage like a, a performance stage. Uh, because in, in the French term, it's like, it, it, it means stadium. So there's like a stadium for the mythic moment of the image to come about. So mirror stage, not as in the mirror, uh, a mirror development moment, but rather a, a, a mirror of image that performs um, on a stage. Uh, what does it have to do? It, it, this has to do with the fact that we're getting at to something that's more structural than developmental. And if you notice in his argument after uh, talking about the ego, the ideal ego, he, he wants to know, like, where does this come from? We shouldn't be really impressed with this Kleinian uh, oral complex, which points at a sort of developmental constituted whole object, a primitive object, which is the breast. And then the baby starts to have symptoms and the symptoms come about. And what we have is a splitting of the ego because the object is not constituted. This object is split between good mommy, bad mommy. And the analyst positions themselves not as like a superior ego, but about a constituted object, the breast where the ego could split so we could see where these defense mechanisms come out, come about. It relies on uh, something that we could maybe, maybe call, and maybe some Kleinians will try to argue, but this is what Lacan sees, is that the sense of, of tracing, you know, the, the structure is one of genetic. And he says, I'm going to give it to you my thesis in the genetic one, which is totally the wrong way which is that there is a originary historical developmental constitutional point from which we start from. And then we see how we traject forward and we get to point B and why the patient has these symptoms or why the patient has psychosis. But as we know, and you pointed out, we're seeing Verneinung, we're seeing the way that the signifier and the, the subject reconstitutes their history in a more structural way, in a way that creates a myth of origin, which is topographical, topological. Topology is important and topographical because topographical regression is the main thing that happens for the psychotic, which leads them to uh, regression, a libidinal regression, not to an earlier stage or earlier historical development to a primitive object, but one of a structural one one that mirrors narcissism in an alienated form, which is secondary narcissism. And this is what creates a defense for Schreiber. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I really liked your summary, uh, Nick, and I wanna zoom in on a little part of it, uh, which was for me, one of the biggest questions that this chapter raised and i mean it's not only in this chapter it's the the references are so many to this night and day uh binary thing right and i understand what it has to do with verneinung and with with the signifier in the sense that verneinung is like the presence through absence in some sense and that's exactly how a signifier works right but the way I understand 
Lacan, when he talks about the signifier, is that it is a chain that goes on through metonymy, right? Whereas when he talks about night and day, there's this word, vice versa, these two mm -hmm. words. And, and Zizek also has them. And I'm confused because this gives me the impression that this is a duality. It goes day, but well, it only subsists through the negation of night in some sense, or it is the negation of night, and night is the negation of day, the Verneinung. Well, then it goes just back and forth, right? There is no chain. No, so what, what it has to do is what we're dealing with, and he talks about it in the, the uh, lecture prior on the Bellamy Miracles, is that this elementary structure of the symbolic opposition that we can see in Schreber, but also in a neurotic, has to deal with a plus and minus and so what the my, uh, the day and night thing has to deal with is that we as as uh, living in a reality which is already symbolically inscribed are dealing with this oscillation of uh, when we talk about peace of the evening, not the uh, opposite of day, but rather what the peace of the evening is, is the affirmation of, of, of evening, not its negation. And so when we get day, we get uh, the 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 affirmation of day on the background of negation. So the yeah. opposite of day isn't night. Rather, the opposite of day is not day. And it's through yeah, yeah. the negativity and the differentiation that something can affirm itself, something different, like night or not night could bring about day. And why this is important is that, well, he talks about this in, in also seminar two to talk about how his odds and evens game and inputs and outputs run. But this this is how like something could be present in a reality that really is not there. And especially why he talks about letter 52. Letter 52 has to deal with the way memory functions. Memory of a symptom of something that uh, presents itself upon an absence. And maybe to kind of dumb it down, it's like he goes back to the, uh, it goes back to the thing where he talks about the piece of the evening. Now, where does it come from? You know, like, uh, is, are we talking about, you know, uh, this, this uh, phenomenon that we experience and not in a phenomenological way, but in a, a sort of sensuous way. And we say that that's piece of the evening um, rather that it, we are always presented with a world of signifiers, but do we operate on that is the question, you know, and it, it goes back to this, this sort of uh, critique of the genetic moment versus the topological moment. It's that we don't have this original moment where we were given one word, like a Chomsky bro would say that, you know, in this universal grammar, we need one word at a time. And then there's like a, 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 a point in the future where we'll have this network of grammar in which we could finally uh, acquire knowledge, like, you know, one fact at a time. Whereas like, we have to start with this myth of origin because we're already presented in a world of signifiers of presence and absence. And that retroactively through historicization, which happens from this memory computation that becomes present and absent, that we could trace back uh, an origin that was never even there to begin with. It's topographical. Yeah. And so I've it got... really works for the, for the, for the thing. Cause you brought up Leclerc, Nick, and that's the same yeah. thing. That's the same thing that Lacan would say. It's that, you know, the signifier wasn't there from like one's, you know, genetic origin, but rather it's a mythic origin that fits for that moment. Right. It's kind of like when he talks, one of the genetic fallacies that he's relying on here is of the primordial signifier itself is yeah. in a sense, a genetic fallacy, because mm -hmm. there is no, it, it's misleading the idea yeah. that it is a signifier. Um, but one thing I thought maybe is that that example of day and night it's kind of a it's a very textbook yeah. tidy sort of like example right because it's a Absolutely. perfect opposition but isn't he saying that if every signifier itself has within it its own op or not opposite sorry like it's its own negation condensed and has this background then maybe even like wouldn't you say an adjective to describe a noun mm -hmm. in a way comes fill in the void of that background yeah or i could be wrong so but like I think, I mean, Zizek kind of says that right he says yeah. 
okay, like they need the background of its own absence. And then yeah. this absence is filled in by another signifier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I mean is that like what he means by opposite, it's not necessarily a literally opposite, right? Like isn't any signifier that qualifies another signifier or just attaches itself to yeah. another signifier something of its opposite so it would be, no it would be so here's the thing it's 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 not that the the opposition is between two different signifiers the opposition lies in with the signifier itself and so what no, we have right. and what we have is um unity and difference so night and not night are the opposition but on that background of negativity we have difference because the signifier also has differentiation so day is not the opposite of night it's it's difference and not in the um the delusian way of like pure mm. vitalistic difference but rather something that is a more contingent structural aspect right no signifier is truly the opposite of another signifier yeah, yeah. it's yeah. just difference it only a, a signifier is opposite of itself and what Zizek proceeds to talk about, of course, is the split subject, which we think of, well, that's me, that like yeah. our own egoistic approach to that would, you know, we fall back on this idea, well, yeah, subject, me, ego, but no, that every signifier in a sense is a barred S. The barred S is like its absence. Yes. Yeah. Its absence. It's, it's, it's yeah. the possibility of its absence. Right. But yeah. It's still, it's because it's split because... itself. Being yeah. and not being, as you'll say in seminar eleven, you know that's the cogito refined. It's like okay, so one signifier, like for example, day, has this. You're saying has this internal absence of itself, mm -hmm. but this is also the reason why no signifier can stand on its own. Mm -hmm. It needs another signifier to fill in this mm -hmm. potential absence. That's mm -hmm. also why they cannot be a primordial signifier because yeah. it already always needs to be a second one that refers back to it. Yeah. It, or fills in. Yeah. The, and and, and, this, that, uh, and that's why with this, like when we look at the way that libido is structured, because I mean, he doesn't say it right here, but in seminar four, libido in its movement and, and, and is, is inscribed by the signifier. And I think he's kind of alluding to that to see how something like peace of the evening came about with, uh, the phenomenon and sensuous experience that we would identify with and also the signifier on its own. Uh, so it's always like a retroactive reinscription. Reality is never reality uh, it, it, or it's umwelt without the its inscription with, with the symbol or the symbolic, which has this opposition of presence and absence. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that like what we see is that with libido and set the, set the sexual object, it's always a refining or what we could see is a refining, not just refining, but a refining. So like it tries to refine an object that was lost, this absence and to kind of refine mm, I like that. Different, different signifiers as well. Um, and, and, and that's the whole point because, you know, there's something that is missing. As you said, like you, the, the signifier can't stand on its own. It's, that's why it needs under, uh, you know, other signifiers. And this is yeah, what it looks like for a neurotic, you know, yeah. and this is the problem with Schraber is that he doesn't have that. And that's, I thought that was perfect. What you said kind of Nick, that what is always refound is that primordial signifier in the sense that it is the signifier that signifies only the lack of another one, mm -hmm. which kind of starts the chain and continues the chain. But that's why I'm confused about this example of day and night, because it's okay, you have day. It is only there because it's potential absence, which then is filled in by night. Mm -hmm. So that's a, it's it's a chain that goes yeah. one, yeah. two, but then he says vice versa. So yeah. right. and the well, absence of, the, of night is filled in by day. And then you have you have a hole, right? Well, well, if if, example. if you're if you're talking about, we have to think about retroactivity, but it's like it's always yeah, going it's, back and forth, um, and and it's like one one is is causing its own absence. But we what what we're what the main thing is is to get the point is that the opposition isn't between night and the day. The opposition is is in, internal with the signifier itself.
and that in order to have a chain, you have to have difference. So difference is not opposition. Um, the opposition yeah. is between uh, what we can think about. Now there's an imaginary and opposition. Yes. There's an imaginary opposition, of course, which has that. And the retroactivity of it is that once night has come to fill in that void, that's where you get the vice versa, right? Because yes. it's like, well, night, instead of the day it, it being its own potential effacement, it's night that it sweeps day aside. We think of it in an imaginary sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, night's opposed to day. Night's the enemy of day, mm -hmm. as opposed to day being its own enemy in a way. Mm -hmm. And, and the retroactivity, because now it's also like, wait, wait, but we start with day, right? Mm -hmm. And then we get night, but then it's kind of like, well, was day there before right. night came yeah and, and this it, is this is kind of like it's also funny because this is something that hegel would do too with like the the here then and now as well in the beginning of the phenomenology um so i thought that was kind of funny uh but it also goes back to what is the retroactivity but a sort of uh uh uh, uh an afterwardness or deferred action which i think i've talked about before it's like my own niche understanding because uh it goes back to topology and, and topographical um if we look at Aristotle, right, we have formal cause, efficient cause, uh, final cause, um, I think was material cause the other one, or is it materially efficient one already? But I think what we have is retroactive cause where effect is the one that creates the cause contradictory, like counterintuitively, it is the effect that was the cause to begin mm -hmm. with. Yeah. And that's what the analyst situates himself as in the transference for the subject to be able to historicize its past in, in the sexual way because the unconscious is sexual. Um, and as far as we're dealing with re repression, it's with, um, you know, the verifying and, and rejection. It's like, there is this like mythic encounter with castration um, and the, the, the primordial signifier, which would bring about something different from the pleasure ego but almost like what we would see in Vernon Young as like this more articulate intellectual order of uh, existence and attribution, uh, the judgments uh, into something different, but it wants to maintain this sort of uh, primitive hallucinatory pleasure ego. And so that's where we have um, Schreber, it seems like in this regression uh, identified with narcissism. This is why like, Look, Freud had, I think, the early sexual essays from like 1905, I think. And then there was like a bunch of revisions after that. And the final revision, if I'm not mistaken, was due to around the time where he was dealing with the Schreber case. He came with uh, he came up with the theory of narcissism to show its relation relation to sexuality, um, not just narcissism as primary narcissism, but the investment, libidinal investment of uh secondary narcissism and this verbal alienation that Lacan will talk about verbal hallucination not in the level of experience and perception although there is some stuff that was what's that term that you guys were like we we're all laughing about scotomized it's something that like yeah. you know, uh in the delusional world uh is blocked off by perception it's like sort of mental barrier um and yet this investment uh is propelled towards like one's own mastery of the delusion but because we don't have the primordial signifier or because we don't have this sublated oscillation of plus and minuses or or uh uh absence and presence what we get is this suspension or um renouncing of reality from schreber because if he is worried about his own autonomy and his own freedom which is dependent upon being God's lover and meeting up with God, that would also end his own world. And so mm. with that and God's limitation, this is so much for him because it's fully present limitation of foreseeing the future. And what is, what is the, the problem of foreseeing the future, but it has to be the with own freedom. And so like what I'm trying to get it's like you could have if, if you have the the symbolic order proper for a neurotic, this knowledge is forgotten. 
because like, as you said, like, it's not ignorance that, that like is underlying repression, but a sort of like structural forgetting. Um, I know he'll say in seminar one, he calls it like, you know, the uh, Heideggerian forgetting about being, but it's not just that you forget about Dasein, but you also forget about forgetting. So that's how you, we should see like re repression, at least you forget this sort of knowledge, this unknown known, as Zizek would say, is the psychoanalytic unconscious knowledge. And the knowledge for it, for for at least Lacan is the knowledge of castration, the knowledge of the primordial sacred fire, which it seems like what he says, the psychotic wants nothing to do about this knowledge. That's what he rejects, uh, a knowing, uh, an ever knowing. I don't forget it, I reject it. The Kind of the overlapping between um, the mystic writing pad and the signifier and all these references to memory is similar to that in the sense that, okay, no signifier can stand on its own, mm -hmm. but that is what is being forgotten. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the same sense that memory is complex, mm -hmm. there is this at least. I mean, in in the letter fifty two, it's like a really long process. Yeah. And in missing writing pad, it's basically just two layers, but there have to be at least two layers for this yeah. process going on. Yeah. And that is what is being forgotten. Yeah. And we should because think of in this process always the castration reappears in the yeah. form that primordial signifier that signifies nothing except the lack of a signifier. Yeah. Right, yeah. And this too has to do with differentiation, you know, not opposition, which it does seem a bit confusing at first, right? Totally, we think, totally. We okay, think I, made it, I made a little drawing, okay? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. That's blurry. Wait, you see? Yeah. Okay. Day signifies not day, filled in by night. Okay, mm -hmm. night signifies not night, filled mm -hmm. in by day. Mm -hmm. And that that's to me, okay, vice versa. Okay, vice well, then versa. there is no chain that goes on. It's just a whole of two. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, I, isn't there, where did I read this? That that is how we're supposed to think of these chains, not as... okay. A link, not as yeah, not as a no, a, but like chains that are in chains. Yeah, mm. like called the, chains. Yeah, chained, like chain. They're chained, but it's not necessarily like mm -hmm. figure a chain that you mm -hmm. like okay. clasp and like all like that. They're chains. Isn't that guy chains. saying that when you put into YouTube just Lacan? Like this, the first guy that comes up who was at, at a university and he starts to draw these circles. Oh, yeah. That, oh, like, I think uh, it's like the Harvard lectures or something. Yeah. Like yeah. It's like, yeah, Lacan and structuralism or something like that. I never actually yeah. watched the, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We, we have to investigate that because I I don't really get, get it. But maybe it we make more sense. another lecture. He comes back to that probably. Yeah. It's not like a marching file. Of soldiers yeah. necessarily yeah like, i like uh, the thing that keeps coming to mind that really has stuck with me from the not two is something he says about this presence and absence he's talking about the phallus and we keep talking about this oscillation of presence and absence and we could think of the primordial signifier as fort dot right he lacan says as much the vocal connoting presence and absence beyond the pleasure principle, the real that's being thrown out, pulled back in, what we might miss there, though, is that what's unbearable for the child is not the fact that the mother leaves, the fact that the mother's here. It's that presence and absence are so diffused with one another that presence is never the full presence of anything absence is never the full absence of anything it's that oscillation itself which is not an oscillation between two antipodes the action itself is what is trying to be mastered it mm -hmm. is like a meta sort of thing yeah it's it is the mastery of its own action that fails that's what drive is in a sense and that yeah. what's unbearable is 
maybe oscillation is kind of misleading in a sense because it's never fully present, it's never fully absent. Either one of those would be the child would be able to deal with. It's the fact that they are so interpenetrating. Yeah, and 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 where you could also see this to manifest up is in the optical schema when we get the introduction of narcissism and the e the ideal ego. Well, what is this confusion of or the synthesis of, but like, you know, the libidinal drives and instincts as 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 we kind of like speculate in that dialogue. But what we see in this image is of the vase and the flowers becoming a wholly constituted image for the eye that's in front of it. But that mirror, that concave mirror is oscillating, like it's revolving. And so the image breaks up. And so in order to constitute presence and absence, it's the the sort of introduction of the symbol, which would create the ego ideal. So that mm -hmm. presence and absence, and, and of course, you'll use the metaphor of the plane mirror. So the plane mirror acts as like where there's a constitution of not only, um, you know, this alien image, but also of continual identification and something even more virtual, which would be the function of language and how language. So we get language in the symbolic order. There, we have to understand this is a difference, and Chiesa points this out in um, subjectivity and otherness, is that before one is really into the symbolic order via castration, one is at the presence of an other qual language. So we can see we have the other qual language and then the other qual symbolic order, which would be the effect of the big other. And that's what would allow sort of language um, in the symbolic order, once it's already present, to manifest into things like uh, rules and customs and where one could be accustomed to the symbolic order mm. and language, uh, which would be the effect of the big other, which is completely, it's nobody, it's a virtual. And yet it's, you know, we could say it's absent, but yet it presents itself in language and signifiers. Yeah. yeah. And, and one symptom, you know, the unconscious is usually absent, but then pre presents itself in the speech act. And so what we have is a, breaking down of speech for full speech for the neurotic. And Berninung is one of those things. Whereas if the psychotic doesn't have that signifier, it, it can't master presence and absence like the baby is trying to in Fort Da. So this identification with the ego and this evil twin of the ideal ego breaks down because of the delusional function and the ever presence of something alien and, and, and foreign to the, the psychotic to kind of be more poetic about it the way Lacan is, but the, the, e the ego breaks down because it has nothing to sustain it. it, it it's, it's, it's a defense of frustration. Yeah. That goes back to, to some great comments that I thought Nick made. And I want to say something about it, but just to resolve my question, while you were saying that and you were saying oscillation and so on, right? I mean, Lacan says that all the time, like it's a circulation, it's an oscillation. And now I recognize what I was missing. The thing is day and night are never simultaneous. Like there is a temporal relation. Yeah. So it goes like this and then starts over, right? Yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, but I wanted to say, like, um, I, I, I thought it was interesting what you said, Nick, and what you just said, Andrew, that um, the ego idea is something that is never really present. Or as you said, Nick, I didn't know, I, I don't remember what which word you used, but something that's never really present, that's never really there, something that you can't see or encounter. And I thought it was so interesting the comments that uh, Lacan made to clarify his talk about a, a discourse of freedom and so on from the previous chapter, right? Because the way I read it, he was basically saying, well, the ideal ego, or he doesn't say ideal ego here, but he just says ego, it's a discourse of reality. But for us neurotics, it has to be supported by a discourse that is not of reality. And that means the discourse that is not of reality is that discourse of freedom, which is symbolic. And we as imaginary egos experience that as 
the idea that we are autonomous in our discourse of reality. Did, did you did you see that the same way or? Well, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's just because it's. What does he say? It's in the same place. He said it's not the same thing, but it's in the same place. When he's talking about the psychotic yeah. delusion, it's in the same place as what I thought of as more of a collective delusion, one that's constitutive of a big other. It's no less a delusion in a sense, but it doesn't lead to the same kind of proliferation of, let's say, local hallucinations in that sense, because it can all be tied in with something that we recognize as an outside to us. More integrated, like the, the ideal ego and the ego ideal. Even though the ego ideal is delusional, he said it's big with delusion, right? In some sense, it's more integrated with the image of ourselves and it supports that image. Whereas I guess what he was saying, I really like that, that one sentence on page 146, um, where he was saying, nothing is to be expected from the way psychosis is explored at the level of the imaginary, since the imaginary mechanism is what gives psychotic alienation its form, but not its dynamics. It's like um, the psychotic relates to this symbolic ego ideal in an imaginary way, but the symbolic is the content of this ima formerly imaginary relation. So that delusional thing manifests as hallucination in their experience of reality but it is that that's why he was saying the discourse of freedom is delusional it yes is the, 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 yeah the discourse of freedom is delusional and it's mainly because like it's different from what he says in prior to this homology about the martyr of the unconscious that there's something that both the neurotic and uh the psychotic are sort of uh martyrs of a witness in bearing one's suffering you know, just like uh, the Christian martyrs would, not that they killed themselves for their beliefs, but that they were persecuted. And so there's this like sort of knowledge of this like moment of a, uh, of a persecution that comes with uh, the primordial signifier, the name of the father and the, the moment of castration. And that he says that there's an open and closed discourse for both of them. And that with the, the closed discourse and the neurotic, that it has to be deciphered. Whereas that it's open for the neurotic because as soon as they try to put it into language, it becomes something that is immobilizing and does not able to match up with the reality and so far that it could be a discourse for others. And so what that means is with the homology of freedom, we have the, the whole uh, layout of slave and bondage and that rather than slavery and bondage being abolished, that they just become generalized in market capitalism. Um, and so within within this slave and bondage uh, discourse, we have a secret discourse of liberation. And what I see that being is like, well, let's look at how like the neurotic is. The neurotic is creating sort of rituals of their life and they ultimately fail. And we could see if there is a, a, a discourse that is secret and needs to be deciphered, uh, let's look at a secret society like Freemasons in which they have secret knowledge that you know, in hopes of being liberated one day, each each moment you get into rituals of initiation and yet nobody knows what the secret is. It's just the fact that there's something words being passed by one another versus the discourse of freedom, which is based upon revolution and revolt. And what that shows is that with this autonomy of liberation uh, of based like which is freedom, but it's, it's more on personal autonomy that it becomes open ended because it doesn't link to anything that is free. You can be like, oh yeah, rights to, to, to happiness, uh, right to vote, right to property, laissez-faire. But none of that is indicative of a universal freedom because yeah. it puts into question the, the question of the other, like the other's freedom. Because as we pointed out, it's like, you know, when one asks like, you know, the best thing for life, you know, and advice, sh should one get married? It's not that like, you know, they really don't want to express that this person shouldn't get married or this person shouldn't do this, um, be not because that's how we secretly feel, but rather that it would place us in a position of superiority that we are ourselves are uncertain about because we're so uncertain about freedom, but yet we're certain that it exists. 
just like Schreiber is so uncertain about he got here that he, but at the same time, he's certain about God's existence and um, this sort of reality to come. And so yet he can't get put and exposed as this position of mastery, even though he tries to master it. That's the difference of what makes it sort of uh, opened. It's because we're uncertain about it. And yet we're also certain about something about it, but yet we can't be put in the position of mastery. That's the whole delusionary aspect of it. It can't be exposed as open-ended because then we would have to suspend reality. So it's like a necessary thing for reality to be animated, um, a necessary discourse for a contradictory reality, as he will put it in, in the, the last lecture. That's the function of how I think what's going on right. with, with Schreber. Mm. Yeah, and, and the, the, the neurotic is not a martyr of that because as no, you no, said, no. Yeah. You just it is symbolically there that this cause mm -hmm. uh enabling our ideal ego image of ourselves as autonomous, but for that to be possible, it needs to be fanine in some sense. It needs to be unconscious. Yeah. Symbolic discourse of freedom. Whereas for the psychotic, they are, for them, it's an open discourse. Yeah. They are the martyrs of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I like that. Yeah. That's good. Nick, did you want to say something? But, but I mean, for me, that resolves the question of, of that homology because I didn't get it last time. Yeah. Because it's the, the difference homology. between liberation and freedom. It's like, well, the, 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 in the attempt of liberation, there's sort of like a, a generalizing a bondage and host. But in, in the way that he sets up the discourse of freedom, it comes from, revolt and revolution so this is sort of like rejection of everything and then abolishing of, of it to something that is more delusional so it's like in a sense could we see that like there's a, a an analogy between the way you know revolutions happen and the, the way that delusion is structured a sort of rejection of something mm -hmm. yeah i mean yeah that's that's already such a good critique of liberalism yeah no definitely <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's like, I don't know how to relate it to Schreber, but I guess it's the discourse of freedom comes up against its own inherent self-limitation. Yeah. Is the way I understand it. It's not an abridgment of rights of autonomy that comes from outside. It's that as, as a discourse, you know, and... A, a discourse is a social bond. I understand it as an intersubjective social bond. As a discourse, this is where we get the very paradox of it, is that once it becomes a discourse, it ultimately reveals the very self-limitation mm -hmm. of, of freedom, which could be like the freedom to enjoy, right? Mm -hmm. To enjoy freely. You know, and, and the idea is, I think you could boil down liberalism to one phrase, which is, hey, as long as it isn't harming anybody. Right. <laughs> yeah. do, do, do your thing as long as you aren't hurting anybody. Yeah. And that's, Whatever yeah. Whatever floats your boat. And the idea is that you aren't encroaching on anyone else's rights. You aren't encroaching on anyone else's autonomy. And there is an imperative placed on you to enjoy. You must enjoy the way you want, the way that, you, how, figure it out. You, you got to figure that out. Yeah. You'll get there, but don't, don't fuck with anybody else's. Right. Enjoyment. Because that right there you just display is uh, what, what the discourse shows is that it's not a freedom that's about individual autonomy, but of a personal discourse. Because once you say, hey, as long as it's not hurting anybody, what's happening is this sort of like infringement of, of the personal and one's neighbor or, or, or the other. But as that stunt displays, it's not that you don't want to reveal something that you feel is like, you know, a judgment against that, that sort of action or sort of a uh, uh, personal choice. It's the fact that you don't want to be put on the spot to make, uh, to be the arbiter of the law because then you expose the openness of the discourse of freedom that there is no freedom and you yourself aren't that as well. You know, it's, it's rather than like saying like, well, I don't want to reveal my secret, uh, my secret uh, 
moralizing judgment on this person. It's not that at all. It's the fact that I don't even have the position to make a judgment because then I'm contradicting my sense of freedom as, as well. So, right. And we also like always present these disclaimers, which is the, the two disclaimers are I'm not an expert and uh, just my opinion, but <laughs> as mm -hmm. if anyone's going to assume you're an expert on anything most of the time. Like, yeah, most people aren't experts on anything. So it's like goes without saying we're not experts. If you say something, this is our that opinion. is your opinion. So, yeah. And we assume that most of what people are saying mm -hmm. is their opinion. But it's funny how we put that out there because otherwise, well, it's funny because it's like you don't want to reveal the fact of bondage as it exists, as it's generalized by the market. Mm -hmm. Because it's like we have to disavow a position of superiority, which is when you're giving someone advice, when you're the subject supposed to know, there is necessarily a master-slave dialectic, which is going on there. But it needs to be disavowed because otherwise it's like, maybe I'm giving you the best advice in the world. Maybe I'm telling you exactly what is good for you. But yeah. the position from which I say it has to be disavowed or else regardless, you know, of the content, I am imposing my will on you. Yeah. And it all goes back to like, you know, the inversion of Dostoevsky's, uh, if, if God yeah. does not exist and all is permitted. No, it's the fact that if God does not exist, nothing is permitted because yeah. you need that discourse or that, that other, that master signifier to allow something to be permitted, permissible. But if that isn't there, then, you know, you can't do anything. You're suspended of any motion. And so even if you disavow it, you're still avowing something. <laughs> yeah. And so how can we, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say in the, dis... you know, in the, in, in, in the whole stunt, you know, that was it. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, that non-aggression principle that you were describing, uh, Nick, right. That's the, isn't that the Ayn Rand people? NAP non-aggression principle. <laughs> I've never heard you can of that. Do anything except it infringes on my freedom, right? Where my freedom starts, yours end, and so on. That's, non <laughs> that's called the non. That's called the non-aggression principle. No, yeah, know. that's like a libertarian phrase, you know. Yeah, like their their principle. But it's like, yeah, that presupposes that autonomy, and this is almost like this universal imposition. Then this discourse of freedom that has to be unconscious mm -hmm. to presuppose to, to make this supposed autonomy possible. But if that is unconscious, right? If you say, well, God doesn't exist, then you're like the total slave of it, of it. because you even think it's your free choice, that uh, discourse of freedom. Anyways, I wanted to ask another question that confused me. I don't know if you have an answer to that because he opens that, question of um what is primary the mother child relation or the child's oh, relation yeah. himself right he he seems to ask that question and then he says or he says something like what i will be about what i will say now will enlighten that problem but does he ever resolve that in any way well i, I understood that as the same as the question of whether there is an umwelt for the human animal, for the human being, in the sense that it's like this uh, mythical moment of auto-eratism in which there's no reality whatsoever. Let's say it's even before this kind of pleasure ego, right? There's no reality whatsoever for the human infant. Let's think of it as a complete sensory immersion in in the flux of the world is at odds with this concept of like the mother being the first object for mm. the child and i think it's the question of like all right well how does the human being form a sense of the outside 
form a sense of an umwelt, which is their own. But for the, you know, for the psychotic, he's saying the mainstream approach is to like restore them to the status of an object in the world, which would be to pierce their delusions, right? It's like, no, that like the great cultural achievement of a supposedly like well adapted sexual uh integration into the the umbelt into the the world that would be the human's own is like object love right is knowing which objects are are good for it and it, it could, we could even connect this back with the liberal discourse in a way it doesn't hurt anybody else it's like that is that that's adaptation right but uh, the if the psychotic is reinvested in the body, then it's like, well, is this a primitive auto erotism? No, that's impossible. There is still a kind of correlate, an outside correlate for the the psychotic in a sense. Uh, how the mother plays in, I'll let Andrew handle that one. But kind of like I think it has to do with this idea of an object how can because via the ego ideal and this is something that i realized it's the ego ideal that allows a person to gain some kind of traction over their own objective presence in the world quote unquote objective presence that is as lacan says be this 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 mirage of themselves as they're seen from outside which is not mm-hmm. how we think we're seeing ourselves as uh, from an outside point of view, except right now that we're on Zoom. This is actually maybe closer to the reality of it. It's like I'm seeing myself talking. But um, Zoom, like all of life is almost a little bit like Zoom in that sense, <laughs> if you're a neurotic, yeah, but not right. for someone like Schreber, who's constantly like being pulled apart, and being invaded, things like that. But with yeah, the mother as this first this first object yeah that was a little bit confusing i guess it's because there's like the idea is that these two stages quote unquote stages are a little bit confused for freud and this leads us back also to the age-old question of are we talking about developmental stages freud seems to say we are absolutely especially in this letter with fleece where i had to breeze over like all the equations and everything because that just i was too tired for all of that but like there's this biolog- biologistic thing that Freud is really struggling to get to, to 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 synthesize with his work, and maybe Lacan makes some headway here, where he's just like, let's get rid of these this idea of developmental stages altogether. Although, I think, and this might, it probably isn't directly addressing what you're asking. I think, though, at times there is something developmental because the Oedipus complex, even though it's like a kind of retroactive illusion, there is a sort of, you know, there there is the uh, idea of object love and arriving there for the neurotic. I don't know if that makes any sense, but. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying he brings that up to basically say, well, ego psychology has this image of a de- developmental stage in which there actually is that overlap between Umwelt and Inwelt. And he's saying, well, no, this presupposes that there has to be a reality and that means there has to be the symbolic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, in simple terms, like, what do we start with? Do we start with full immersion? Yeah. Where we're not anything at all or do we begin with, and I guess maybe Andrew, you can confirm or disaffirm this, whether when he talks about the mother here, he's also kind of evoking uh, object relations. It's like our, our first object is the mother, maybe. And then I don't and know, like what's the first object to start with? Why he brings it up and is he asking a question or is he criticizing that question? Or if he's asking a question, is well, it resolved? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think like when it comes to the the mother issue, it really doesn't necessarily have to deal with object relations. But insofar as he's building up like his stance, you could see how it, it could be a general critique of object relations. 
what I think he's just talking about when it comes to the mother, it's like, okay, we start with like, obviously the standard mythic moment of like the, the mother and the child, because who, who is uh, traditionally said to be closest to the child, but the mother. Right. Um, and so as Freud and even someone like uh, Laplanche would show us that uh, we get these uh, moments of hallucination that come in where the mother's not the object, but rather what is being hallucinated upon um, the excitation of the drives is uh, the hallucinatory object for satisfaction. And then when we have something that is called auto erotism, we have, not a, a baby that is just thrown or, 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 or a speaking being that would be soon. Um, but the human animal is no longer in a world that is purely exterior. And uh, the German term is uh, Außenwelt, which is just outer world. Um, and then it becomes uh, a world, an all two world, which would be autoerotism. It's only through uh, narcissism where we get bodily mastery. And so the the investment becomes in the body. Um, and so what I think Lacan is trying to show is that the mother isn't the object, but is rather the site for the baby's drives and, and libido to be able to formulate a, a hallucinatory um, object or hallucinatory ego, a primitive ego that is able to judge what is pleasurable and what is bad. We could interject and, and project. Um, and then the other virtual object would come into the form of narcissism as its one's own body. Um, and then, th but like this would still be a critique against the ego psychology at, or object relations, at least for object relations, because they see the mother and the child as in this one-to-one -one relationship. Um, uh, and I know everybody, will, every other uh, re object relational will have a different stance. I know something, somebody like Winnicott says that the, the child does not exist because it's just like a, it, it's really the mother. Uh, I just, I don't, I don't buy that. But um, what what they believe is like I said before, like this genetic moment of a, of an actual beginning where there is a constituted object and it is a breast rather than taking into account uh, the function of libido and its structuration um, in these uh auto erotism, uh, narcissism, uh, object love, and then forms of regression in the topological sense, like secondary narcissism, um, or even how we get the function of dreams for, for Freud and, and Lacan that, and Laplanche says that, well, this moment of hallucination that we see in the baby is also manifesting in dreams with this sort of retroactively going back to, uh, the encounter of seduction, which is the origination of the scene of sexuality, infantile sexuality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that was a little too much or if that kind of clarified a lot of things, but I think it's mainly uh, more of like not the mother and the child, but how the mother becomes like the background for the baby to develop its sense of like what is pleasure. Right, because on, on narcissism, he describes two different types of narcissism, right? It's like... Mm -hmm what one was, what once belonged to one, the anaclitic one, like to be one kind, and then the anaclitic type, yeah. which is like a caregiver. Yeah. The, what is it, the paralytic and the anaclitic or something like that? I forget what the first kind is called, yeah. but then it's like ana anaclitical. Yeah, which has to do with like some form of like attachment with libido. Attachment, yeah, to the caregiver or the person that protects. Yeah, which is not to... Not to to get confused with attachment theory. Um, mm. In fact, I mean, you're reading Freud in the sexual, right, Nick? Like Laplanche will say that attachment is just one aspect or, you know, attribution of libido, but libido is constitutively sexual, which is something that right. the detractors of Freud want to get rid of, you know, and in object relations, they don't see libido as sexual, but object seeking. Or there, and, and someone like uh, Fairbairn uh, will say that, like, I don't understand you know, this whole sexual thing, because it's confusing because Lloyd, uh, Freud will, will talk about, uh, you know, uh, libido and the object of love, you know, it, it wants the satisfaction of love, but he doesn't understand the sublimated part in, in, in um, the sexual and satisfaction. So he just says that libido is object seeking. And then you have libido ego, which is ego seeking. And like all these different. Oh, yeah. That essay is like, yeah. 
that essay is con- like I've read that essay three times and I still need to always go back to it because the whole distinction between ego libido or what lib- what is it? Oh, like, I'm talking about Forenzi. I'm talking or oh, not Forenzi, a uh, Fairburn. Fairburn. Oh, okay. object, object, I, I relations, that. object relations. Now it's been you know, a long day, but you know, Freud Freud's do, is is caught in his own dualism because he wants to put a distinction between the ego drives or ego instincts and, and libido drives, one on the level of self-preservation, other one on like, you know, uh you know, satisfaction, um, on the level of the sexual. But I mean, that's like another story. Now that you said duality, uh, kind of my brain went, oh, day and night, that's a not two. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. I I mean, I'm still not sure why he brings it up because he seems like he says Freud himself. And if Lacan says Freud, most of the time he's, he's saying something positive, right? He isn't saying this is bullshit. And he isn't saying that's unimportant to ask that question or to resolve that tension between auto eritism as primary or mother child as primary. And the sentence after he opens that question up is the question is that of the human being's primordial access to his reality. Mm-hmm. So I guess the primordial access is the primordial signifier. But yeah, how does that relate to these uh, relations of autoerotism and mother-child? Did, did well, because you, you would you would get from these sort of, um, and we're not, let's not even talk about on the level of psychoanalysis. Let's point from like a sort of biology, uh, sort of uh, d- developmental, uh, you know, behavior behavior science, um, the development of the baby with in relation to the caregiver of the mother, versus what. Lacan is kind of seen, and of course he's in dialogue with a lot of like the French um, zoologists at the time, and uh, he's definitely influenced by Uxgrill, the the uh, German yeah. philosopher who was the one that founded the uh, Innenwelt Umwelt. And so, like, what he's trying to show is that it's the it's pretty much the same argument of like what came first, the chicken or the egg, but kind of different because it, it, you could see it tie in well what, what came first is it this sensuous experience of evening or is it the signifier of peace of the evening mm. you know and so we're obviously we're not in a in an, an ausenwelt we're in in in, in umwelt we're already in a, a thrown in the symbolic order but it hasn't became like a part of the psychic apparatus of the the human animal um and so we're already have drives in the libido but I would say it's that there is a sort of site of contradiction or tension between auto erotism and um, the signifier, the primordial signifier, because when it finally appears and it, and it has to do with this mythic moment of uh, judgment exists of existence and attribution mm-hmm. in Verneinung. And I think this is why he's emphasizing on the end, the importance of Verneinung and how this, uh, place in with the introduction of the primordial signifier in in a world where we have a a a being that is uh libidinally invested now auto erotism means that it's like there's a libidinal world but it's not a libidinal world of objects like object love it's just i think like you can sort of read it on a certain meta level too because it's like this whole lecture is in some ways an implicit critique i think of freud's biologism and when he talks about his like this genetic explanation that he's going to lay out for everybody he's saying don't believe what i'm saying unfolds in this sequence yeah remember my style he says outright is dialectical (laughs) don't get it twisted right (laughs) and it's interesting he's pointing something out not not so much to criticize freud i think but to criticize how people misread him in some ways by focusing on these stages and trying to mm-hmm. locate you know an or- originary moment mm-hmm. in a way yeah. and i think that's really interesting but it makes me think of something that milner makes which is a super subtle point that's really fascinating is it's like if if freud's grave 
error was to succumb to a kind of like biologism to like a biologico anatomical understanding of things in stages of trying to aspire to the ideal of science. It's like his counter move, Lacan's counter move is to sometimes present things in a his- historicizing way. Mm-hmm. And that's like, that's almost pretty much we could think of it as like a fallacy that I think Freud uh, Lacan uses to his advantage, although it's confusing and it's a way of dealing with this question of biological stages mm-hmm. versus what we see illustrated in the Baromian knot. That's mm-hmm. like retroactive yeah. imaginarizing of the symbolic where things don't unfold in this linear way. But the way he portrays that is through this kind of almost what seems like historicizing logic. And he's Mm -hmm. doing that when he invokes this discourse of of freedom, for example, because it's Mm -hmm. like, or if he, or what you said earlier, Andrew, that was very good i mean it fit right into the conversation here where it's like where you were talking about if god's dead everything is permitted no if god's dead nothing is permitted it it, one wonders it's like so there is he saying that the the big other is a historical phenomenon that there was an era prior to you know um market capitalism where bondage wasn't generalized these are questions that you can't help but think of and i think milner's point is like no this is like lacan has accounted for this in his very technique it mm-hmm. is it, it is uh in, intentionally in some ways um not misleading but like yeah. an illustration of what he's doing it's yeah it, top it, of it, almost. does it, that make sense that- yeah, and isn't that 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 statement funny? That reversal, like uh, God is dead, therefore nothing is permitted. And it's like with this sort of dialectical approach, we you know we see a world that is already there and made. And once we retroactively go back to an origin, we find out that you know the maker of the world is not there in the spot that he should be. You know he's gone. Mm. It's like the sort of deadlock. You know that the, the sort of uh, real antagonism of the symbolic order. And, and, you know, how it operates in, like, the psychotic and the neurotic. The world is made, but the maker is dead. <laughs> it's not in the spot where you should be. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because we've talked about this before. Even for Schreber, it's like God needs the writing down system, right? Yeah, because the world is even a world that's dead. Affairs. Yeah. Because yeah. it's still very much the God of a, a post-Enlightenment world, which is almost de- almost like a deist sort of got it like winds the clock yeah and then steps away from from the clock yeah. you know yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> yeah no definitely should we Anyways. end it there yeah no i have i have one more question uh, <laughs> okay yeah for sure for you guys because we we talked about these de- developmental stages and so on and i think that comes back to the very beginning of the chapter about understanding and we already talked about it a little bit right i think for example understanding would be that mode of uh, developmental stages right because you have something substantial yeah some substantial reason or moment or whatever yeah. and he says two different things that critique understanding um in two different moments yeah. of the chapter the first one is like the point of psychoanalysis is it, like it doesn't rely into uh situating the paradoxes of the ego via the analyst like the ego psychology would nor is it in the jungian sense of making thought conscious you know what that that thought was unconscious and now it's conscious it's not trying to bring stability and wholeness in that sense uh or 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 conscious stability by right thinking you know it's situated in, in something different that has to deal with like you know that 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 sentence that you that you read in the beginning that had to do with like um 
you know, so long as psychoanalysis like is situated in a discourse, you know, of language, you know, it's it, it has to uh, realize that uh, it does not mi misrecognize impurity. It doesn't uh, misrecognize language with impunity. Impunity. So That's a great mishearing. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> the it great should not hearing, yeah. misrecognize impurity. That's yeah. 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 Very good. It's yeah. true. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> yeah. But also in the sense of when he talks about memory, and I think this is like where we, even if Freud had an error in his biologism and resorting to biologism, it doesn't mean that like this is like the end of all of Freud's system because like what he's trying to show is that there is a, like a dialectical or structural kernel in, in 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 these instances when we understand the essays like screen memory when we look at like the way that he talks about like the the dream or um the memory in in, in uh, letter fifty two we're dealing with something that and he even says like if Freud. You know, if Freud uh, was talking about something of like, you know, memory that we actually like had, you know, he would be a Jungian in the way that there was some type of meaning in there. But no, there's something of like uh, this process of presence and absence in which we get, you know, something in where like in the combination an effect happens. Right? It's, it's like structure. That's it's why he structure. starts out with it. Structure yeah. opposed to substantial understanding. Substantial, uh, yeah. Yeah. And that's behind the phenomenon, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that it's a meaning or yeah. something substantial behind yeah. it. It's just a structure. It's the and conditions like, of possibility of a phenomenon. And that's why yeah, he, it's a and, transcendental aesthetic. And and that's why he's like he's saying that when he wants to talk about the phenomenon, he's not doing a phenomenology. Um yeah. but in the phenomenon there's something that we got to be skeptical of and that's where we, I guess we could call it conditions of possibility because he wants to see that structure and even for psychosis structure and form uh appear within the phenomenon uh yeah. whereas yeah. like in, in phenomenology they deal with bracketed out and they want to find an uh, a phenomenological reduction uh givenness or da sign or something that is a priori and a priori that we get from a phenomenon of givenness it's uh, not that far away from derrida's critique of this presence you know metaphysics of presence metaphysics of presence yeah. yeah but anyways i wanted to say like okay it's not about understanding it's about structure and then on the bottom of that page he says contrary to what has been thought the fact that it's present doesn't imply a solution so talking about the unconscious mm -hmm. but on the contrary a very special inertia that so i read that not referring necessarily just to psychotics but uh, the unconscious as a solution is in the mode of understanding because you're saying, oh, it's it's like a meaning solution, a final cause of instincts or drives or whatever. But instead, the unconscious is a very special kind of inertia in the sense that it doesn't have meaning. It's in the gaps. Or did you read that as referring explicitly to psychosis, the sentence? Unconscious is not a solution. It's a special kind of inertia. Yeah, yeah, because because for him, there. I mean, this is where we would see the special kind of inertia show in the statement of like what he says at the beginning. The, there, there is the unconscious, but it doesn't function. Yeah, but I think for the neurotic, I think there is, and maybe I don't want to. I, I don't want to spitball, but I kind of want to. There's my Bernard. I don't mean to spitball, but. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it goes back to like when we talk about the suspended movement of the drive. I think there is like in a sense this uh, inertia to the unconscious, but a functioning inertia versus like the uh, the the primordial signifier that appears for the psychotic. It just has no function at all because I guess for the function to operate, there needs to be the knowledge that comes with it, the knowledge of castration um, and the law like has to be implemented the name of the father and the phallic function if i'm reading it right and i'm not getting but the, there's i i remember something that you know zizek says periodizing lacan and um sublime object where he says you know early for early lacan the unconscious is the site of the drive 
Later, yeah. Lacan is going to see the unconscious more as like almost, I don't think I totally get what that sentence is going for, but as almost aiming for a kind of inertia in order to deal with the real of the drive where it's like, it's as if the unconscious is more in line with the, the, the pleasure principle. Whereas is at this point, you know, with the repetition of the symbol for Lacan, the, the drive is, is the unconscious is located in the unconscious, mm -hmm. the unconscious, I mean, you could correct me if I'm wrong here, Andrew. I think I'm going out on a limb, but like the unconscious is not necessarily um, a, a an attempt to resolve drive. Right, I mean, and I, I, I actually, I actually find that interesting. So what was the what did Zizek say? Because I do, I think that is something interesting to say. Um, he has like three periods of Lacan. He periodizes Lacan like early, middle, and late. I think. Maybe there's even maybe there's even more than that. Maybe there's like five different passages. I I'm gonna find that later because it's but really I, interesting. But he talks about how it changes. I like that because if you look at the later Lacan, we're talking about like not a, a split subject, but a speaking being the parlette, I think is what he calls it. Um and if they're if we're talking about the drive and discourse, well, something that I guess it's suspended on and, and um and this real that it can't resolve is going to be the antagonism of the, of, of the non-rapport. Because right. I, mean, I, I to right. clarify my question, I read inertia as in the sense as an obstacle to understanding. Because before that, there's the sentence about if some time ago psychiatry took a backward step that consisted in distrusting explanation so as to install understanding so psychiatry you try to use explanation for understanding mm -hmm. but the unconscious is not a solution yeah in the sense of an understanding but it is more like an obstacle yeah yeah it's like the, you down in understanding. Yeah. The, the unconscious yeah you can't try to understand the unconscious and you can't explain the unconscious away that's the main thing yeah. you have to listen and the unconscious is temporal like it, it, it does deal with temporality. And I think if we talk about the uh, a middle stage in Lacan, seminar 11 has to do with temporality of the presence and absence of the unconscious um, as a fissure, as you'll call it, I think, um, temporal fissure. Yeah. Anyways, I'm excited. Speaking of temporal that. fissures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go. I'm gonna go eat. This is good, so this 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 I'm lecture. Yeah, this lasagna. lecture is brought to you by Kid Cuddy day and night. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. The original version of that song was called The Absence of Day. <laughs> <laughs> and night can fill in the void. Day and night. <laughs> The lonely shaver <laughs> tries to free his mind. <laughs> That's a meme right there. You gotta... <laughs> All right. Uh, that was good. All right. Well, let's... Time to quilt. Peace. Peace. <laughs>